기대 많이 하고 계실 것 같은데요. 올해 기조 연설은 브라이언 카원 전 아일랜드 총리님 그리고 염재호 고려대 총장님의 대담 그리고 앨런 랭어, 랭어 미국 하버드대 교수님의 강연으로 함께 진행이 되겠습니다. 첫 번째 기조 연설자로 브라이언 카원 전 아일랜드 총리님을 모시고 국가 미래를 위한 리더십의 역할이라는 주제로 강연을 청해 듣도록 하겠습니다. 사회 그리고 대담은 염재호 고려대 총장님께서 맡아서 진행을 해 주시겠습니다. 두 분을 단상으로 모시겠습니다. 여러분 뜨거운 박수로 환영해 주시기 바랍니다. 드리겠습니다. Okay, good morning, everybody. And it is my great honor and prestige to host uh, this first uh, pre preliminary session. Especially, uh, we have uh, a very prominent uh, world leader from Ireland, uh, Mr. Brian Cowan, and he is a very innovative and uh, a great leader. Uh, to uh, lead the Ireland country, even though it is a very small country, but it is very, very innovative and competitive uh, EU country uh, in the world. Uh, let me very briefly introduce him. And he started as a member of Irish Parliament uh, since 1984. And unlike any other ministers, he served the various positions of minister he started as a labor minister in 1992 and served as a transport, energy, and communication minister. And then from 1997, he served as a health and children minister. And from 2000, uh, he served uh, as a foreign minister. And then finance minister, especially during the financial crisis uh, in the world. And then uh, since 2008 to 2011, uh, for three years, he served uh, Prime Minister of Ireland. Uh, we've discussed a little bit in the early morning this, uh, this morning, and he has a lot of ideas, especially for the uh, human resources and human capture. Uh, you know, as the President Kim already mentioned that, uh, in Korea, we don't have any natural resources, but human resources, and it is very similar to uh, Ireland. And also, Ireland has a very globalized yeah, country, and they receive a lot of foreign direct investment and very good international companies and industries and laboratories are very prospering these days. So we can listen to his yeah, first uh, preliminary speech and then uh, around the 30 or 40 minutes, and then we will yeah, discuss the human uh, resources in the 21st century. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, please, to the podium. Thank you. Well, please morning, welcome yeah, Prime Minister Cowan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here in Seoul. I just arrived yesterday evening. Uh, and in typical Korean fashion, you had me working within an hour of my arrival, which was, we had a lovely uh, dinner yesterday evening in preparation for this conference this morning. So it's a great honor to join with uh, Professor Young here to today. And the many distinguished guests, colleagues from Guatemala and Myanmar, my own ambassador from Ireland, Angela O'Donnell, who's here, and I'm delighted to meet with her this morning as well. <clears throat> it's a very challenging a topic, very broad-ranging topic that you've brought for us to speak about this morning and during the course of this conference. Let's dream and challenge and create. I'm trying to talk about the leadership of the future, the sort of leaders we need in the future. I think from uh, my point of view, you could, you could be entitled to say, well, you're not a leader anymore. What are you doing here? <laughs> um, democracy is that good way of telling you when to get out. Um, but I think that we've all, you know, drawn experience, and certainly since the crisis and leaving politics in 2011, I've had an opportunity to reflect on 
all of that and what, what we had to do during that period. Uh, and the only consolation I always give myself when I look back at my political career is that after the financial crisis in 2008, every one of my colleagues in, in the European Union, with the exception of Chancellor Merkel, also lost their, their power base and had to leave politics. Some have made a, a bit of a return, but uh, I decided to leave it at that. But the, um, the reason why I, I'm really anxious to, to speak about this is because a lot of people I know from Korea would be entitled to say, well, what's a small country over on the far side of the West Atlantic got to do with us? And certainly that would have been the case for many years before uh, the modernization of both our countries. Uh, the tyranny of distance dictated a relationship which was uh, one that was rare. But I, I think we all know that the technology, technological developments uh, and the globalization factor and the fact that we all live in a global village now where there's an immediately uh, a lot of information, we know exactly what's going on within any part of the world within seconds, uh, is an indication of how interactive and interdependent we all have become. And when we talk about transformational leadership, as we talk about the fourth industrial revolution and how we're going to live in the 21st century, having seen the rate of change we've seen in the last 100, 150 years, probably greater than any change we saw in the previous millennia, uh, that indicates to us that there's a great rate of change that we're all very conscious of in our own lives, in our personal lives, in our work lives, in how we see our society developing. Uh, but we also recognize, I think, that unless there is a clear strategy, unless people can be communicated that there is a direction, that there is a sense of where we fit into all of this informatics and all of this technology and all of this trade and all of this activity that's going on around the world. Unless we face into that and understand it, it's very hard for us to lead, to lead a company, to lead our family, to lead a country. So there has to be an understanding and an analysis of what is happening as a precursor to providing any sort of leadership that can be effective. Um, and I think that the great uh, similarity between Ireland and Korea has been this openness to international trade. As a small country, we pivoted in the late 1950s when a political leader arrived of the older generation who got his chance as prime minister, who looked to the prospect of European uh, membership of the European Economic Community as a means of diversifying our markets as a means of adding value to our primary production. We were an agrarian society at the time, primarily. And I think that Korea also has looked to the world in an effort to uh, set out its place, that it is prepared to get out there and compete in what is a very competitive environment. But it also, of course, has relied on human capital. We didn't have much natural resources. You had the location advantage of a Singapore. You had the big size of a, of a China. You had the resources of a Malaysia. But Korea found its own niche, its own position, and built on its strengths, and identified the innate ability of its own people and how it could develop those through an education system that was relevant to contemporary needs. And Ireland did the same by making some transformational changes in our education system, which broadened access to education. Free secondary education came in in the 1960s. There were many parts of our society before then who couldn't look to an education beyond 14 or 15 years of age. It went into semi-skilled, uh, traditionally skilled jobs in, in, in construction and, and, and elsewhere, in farming and agriculture. So transformational leadership is about charting a bold course of action at any particular time recognizing and understanding what the nature of the difficulty or the opportunity is, and being able to then communicate to the public what it is you want to do and getting them to come with you. And there has to be that sense of hope uh, that there is something going to change, that there is a wider, more inclusive prosperity available to society's interests that wasn't there before. So inclusive growth is a very much an important component of being able to bring our society transformationally to the next step of development, whether it's economic or social or indeed political. And to be able to do that, you need leaders who are clear and authoritative and understand exactly what's happening and why the country should go in a certain direction. And the fact that you have to have export-led growth, that we can't, you know, we were a small country of taking both north and south six million people, 
unless we sell out into the world, we can't, unless we create value out in the open marketplace, we couldn't envisage the sort of prosperity that we've been able to achieve, despite the ups and downs, and I'll come to those in a moment in terms of the recent crisis. Korea itself went through the crisis in Asia in 1997, and huge changes had to take place pretty quickly in order to adapt to what was a totally new situation. Ireland similarly had to do the same. And it came through a very difficult period. But the one point I would make, this one? Yeah. the one point I would make is that, is that moving? The one thing they didn't show me is how this works, I have it. <laughs> Preparation and everything except the technology. Um, but the one thing that we were able to establish is that by having export-led growth, we could have sustainable growth greater than our competitors. And that's how we built up our, our prosperity over the years, similar to Korea since the 70s in particular. So the similarities are this exceptional long-term growth, the reliance on exports, the success in attracting foreign direct investment, the importance of the services sector, a highly educated population, and of course focus on energy efficiency as a component in that growth. And I think it's very important that reliance on exports is understood as a key factor in prosperity. If we have an open trading system, and we hear a lot, unfortunately, at the moment about protectionist policies, populism has become a very uh, prominent issue in our politics in many parts of the world, in Europe, with the migration crisis in America, we're seeing it during the course of this presidential election. And we have to be voices against that. We have to stand up and say, unless we can have open trading systems, unless we have that, then smaller countries like ourselves are victims because the larger countries impose their own protectionism for their own particular purpose. And we've been, we have been lucky in that, as members of the European Union since 1973, we have been able to under the guise of the legal rules of the treaties, being able to protect our interests and see our interests being protected by the European Commission so that competition rules and trading rules are fair for all. And we have also had the advantage as an English-speaking country, and the only English-speaking country, I suppose, that had the, as a member of the Euro system, the, Euro, the European monetary system uh, and the Euro currency, that's a big sell, a unique selling point for Ireland in terms of its foreign direct investment policies in creating a platform for the European single market for, by foreign director, investors by locating in Ireland. So that reliance on exports, and you can see how open the economy is, but over 100% over of our GDP is represented by the level of exports that we, we provide. Attracting foreign direct investment was an absolute critical factor in economic transformation in Ireland. Because why? Since independence in 1922, right up to the 60s, there wasn't a big capital base in Ireland. There wasn't inherent wealth in the country. Uh, prior to independence, the wealth was concentrated in the hands of a few. Subsequently, we had to establish this idea of political independence, get people to understand beyond the colonial past, and then seeing through members of the European Union that we could diversify our markets and create greater, more allies than just simply depending on the traditional market of the UK beside us. But we have developed our relationship with the United Kingdom bilaterally and as co-members of the European Union. And over the last 40 years, that has matured to a great extent so that now the peace process that uh, started in Ireland about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and brought an end to violence there in, in Northern Ireland, we've been able to work with our British counterparts to make that happen. And it's, it's nice to know and inspiring to know that people like the Colombian peace deal I spoke to my Guatemalan colleague about last night, again, they look to the inspiration of the Northern Ireland peace process uh, as something that could be worked on or something that could be a template of what they're trying to achieve there, as indeed the Guatemalans themselves have had to do uh, themselves. So political development, development of pluralist societies, open democratic values, and openness to trade, these are the sort of value systems that a, a society has to have in the 21st century, in my opinion, particularly smaller countries. Unless we do that, that we allow the larger country the natural advantage that size and scale gives them. 
but it's also about promoting inclusive growth throughout the world. There are parts of the world, as we know, which require uh, to be assisted and to be helped and developed. And it's in our interest to see it as a win-win situation, not a, a winner-take-all situation. The migration crisis, if you like, that's developed because of, okay, political developments and wars that have taken place in the Middle East and Libya and elsewhere, Syria. It's also because of the fact that quite apart from those decisions and those conflicts, you also have a situation where the disparity in income between North Africa, for example, and Europe is such. Why should we be surprised if I'm an Algerian or a Moroccan looking across the Straits of Gibraltar and seeing an average income for people in Spain of maybe 23, 24,000 euros, and I'm on 5,000 euros, why would you be surprised that people wouldn't try and make the journey across and get a better opportunity for themselves and their families? So inclusive growth, balanced growth, sustainable growth, that allows all parts of the world, all parts, all regions in the world, to develop at a stage for which they are ready and capable of, of achieving is something that we have to in, insist upon as, we, as, as time goes on. But to come back to our own situation in Korea and indeed in, uh, in Ireland, we know that it's really about our own people, educating our own people. When you think about leadership, whether it's in the workplace or as a country, it comes back to the basics again. It's about unleashing the potential of your own company workmates, your own management team, people who are working and producing whatever it is you're producing to a high standard and to a rate and state of excellence that's sufficient to increase market share in the world and, and in a competitive economy and um, a competitive marketplace. That is the key factor. And by educating our people, we give them the ability to achieve that potential. Those areas and those societies that do not increase the critical faculties, do not make for inquiring minds. And there are parts of the world, as we know, where rota systems of learning are in fact depriving those and future generations in those countries of the chance to have decency uh, in, their, in their human existence, to have the ability to have shelter and food, the ability to raise a family with some sense of stability and hope and aspiration for the future. And that's something that we in the West, and indeed in Asia, take for granted. But in many parts of the world, that is something to be achieved in the next 20 years by societies who are striving to do so. And I think it's also, if we look for our young people, because we're trying to involve, if you like, getting our young people to look at the public space as a place where they can spend part of their career too. Too often, I think, business people particularly, in my own country and I'm sure here and elsewhere, try to suggest government's job is to let us at it, let us do what we wish, let us, let us off there on our own. And we saw where that sort of capitalism gets us. It creates banking crises, it creates financial crises, ordinary people uh, are the casualties of that sort of approach. What we need, of course, is proportionate regulation that understands that we live in an interdependent world, a world trading system that operates fairly for everyone, a legal system that allows us to find um, resolution to problems when they arise, a law-based system that's available to all. And with a highly educated population who see potential, who see the opportunities, who can analyze and, and critically understand what's happening, whether it's in their own particular sector, in the workplace, or what's happening societally, in terms of increasing participation of our women in society, increasing uh, the participation of those who are marginalized in our society. How do we get people to be included in the solutions rather than exclusive solutions for the privileged few? Stability in a, in, in a society that's highly educated must involve fairness, and must involve access, and it must involve equal opportunity. Without that, you put at risk the objectives you set in yourself. And that's something that we all have to learn. We also have to learn that in an international world in which we live, that our international institutions need reforming. We cannot prepare for the 21st century 
on the basis of a settlement after World War II as to how we run the United Nations, for example. We need people to understand that the G7 is no longer the place where an inclusive consensus on economic policy can take place. The G20, as we all recognize, is now regarded as a more important forum. Why? Because the fact is that growth throughout the world is not the exclusive preserve of those uh, societies who were, who were, if you like, in the ascendant in the, in the 40s and 50s. So the world is changing. And if people, young people especially, are to look to civic leadership as an area in which they're interested, quite apart from what they want to do in pursuing their own careers, if the public sphere is to mean anything, then we need to make sure that we provide fora for effective solutions to be found to problems. There was a greater sense, I think, in the 60s, uh, when we looked at global, the global leadership structure in, in the world, a greater sense that we could deal with the big issues. You know, there is sufficient technology knowledge in the world today to deal with endemic poverty. Why is it not being addressed? There is a failure to communicate on a global basis that the win-win situation for every country at whatever stage of development they're at really depends upon uh, people having access to opportunity. When you look at what's happened on energy efficiency, that's another area, and I think the Korean people are to be congratulated for their green, uh, their green initiatives, because they see that as, a future, as, as, as an industry. We're seeing now those countries who have seen sustainability as an important economic objective. It's not something to be taken on as a sort of an adjunct or a, an optional add-on. It's absolutely critical uh, for the ability of societies or indeed industries to thrive is that they have a sustainable uh, growth strategy that is, that is respectful of the environment and that understands that people want quality of life as well as money in their pocket. So that's another area where we obviously need to do a lot more work. I think one of the big issues for leadership in the 21st century are demographic factors. We know, for example, that's a big challenge here in Korea, it's a big challenge in many developed societies. Ireland is somewhat unique in the European context in that we're probably 25 or 30 years behind other societies in terms of the youth profile of our population. Over 40% of our people are under 30, 26, 27 years of age. So that ensures that we're able to say to the international investment community, if you invest in Ireland, there will be an expanding labour force that's suitably equipped and educated to provide, if you like, the manpower and the woman power to develop your industries in Ireland as a platform, as I said, for the single market and beyond. Our dependency ratios, where we will have, we will have four in the workforce for every one pensioner, is something that we'd still have over the next 10, 15, 20 years. But beyond that, our dependency ratios will, will increase quite significantly. So the need for long-term planning, the need for pension provision, for getting people to save, making sure that retirement ages are going to go up, our longevity as a people, we live longer. I think the, ex the life expectancy in Ireland has gone up 10, by 10 years for both men and women in the last 25 years alone. That's an indication that, you know, if we're to have proper pension pr provision for people, we need to have policies in place that enable people to save some of their money and not consume all of their money during their income earning years so that there is a, a money available for the retirement phase of their lives. And that's an issue that's being avoided by governments throughout the world today, and it needs to be addressed. So coming to, these were all the good things we did. You're entitled to then say, what happened to you three years ago? Well, I think, you know, like Korea was one of the Asian tiger economies, we were known as the Celtic tiger economy. And it has to be admitted, looking back to some complacency set in, some uh, national hubris set in, we started to believe all our own propaganda, not our propaganda, but we, seen, we didn't see coming down the track that there were inherent weaknesses in some of our growth strategy as well. 
And a failure to analyse that, of course, wasn't just limited to Ireland. It was international agencies that you sometimes rely on to come in and peer review what you're doing. For example, in 2008, May 2008, the International Monetary Fund told me that our banking system was one of the most best regulated around. By September, I knew exactly what that meant. Nothing. And the fact is, we didn't have a properly regulated system. We, we had an over-reliance on indirect taxation. The reason why we reduced our direct taxation on our lower paid was A, because we felt it was socially equitable. B, it was a way of maintaining as, for as long as possible traditional manufacturing, component manufacturing that was going on in Ireland since the 70s to, to if you like, increase the longevity of that industry by, make, by keeping our labor costs down uh, and avoiding social charges for people on low wages. It was also a way of avoiding the poverty track, trap and increasing employment as we got employment down to three or four percent, which is practically full employment. But when 2008 came, we had a fiscal crisis and a banking crisis. And I suppose people have been asked by the organizers to, you know, to talk in personal ways sometimes about what happens with leaders when you're faced with existential threats, not just the normal up and down of, of politics, but what you're, when you're faced with an, ex an existential threat, you know, what's the leadership role? I think facing into a, an economic crisis that was the biggest since the depression of the 1930s was an indication as to how serious things had, were. But it was also clear that at European Union level, we didn't have a, an EU-wide policy. It was up to every country to deal with their own problem. And the fact is, there wasn't much time to deal with the problem because once post Lehman, within weeks, we had a situation where because a lot of our wholesale bank lending from other parts of Europe were in Euro, was Euro-dominated. Once the liquidity went out of that market, we had people who were banks which looked like they were in good shape suddenly, very quickly, uh, getting into serious trouble. And we had to make a decision. The decision was made on the 29th of September. We had the central bank there. I had my Minister of Finance there, myself, some of the regulators. And it was clear that we had to make a big decision. But the big issue was not that we had to make the decision, it was the recognition that it was politically dynamite to make the decision, but it had to be made. In other words, I could see that my career wasn't going to be any greater than one term, but it was a decision that had to be made. And we made it. And people often then look at the banking system, and they're not very popular, obviously, bankers at the time or since, but you can't save an economy and kill the banking system. In a modern, commercially traded economy, the proper analogy is that the banks, if you like, are the lifeblood of the system. The banks ain't there, you become a cadaver very quickly. So the growth, the return to growth would have been put back by decades had we not made the decisions we had to make. Being able to sell that politically against the background of growth annually of 55 or 6% per year for the previous 10 years, and then suddenly having a contraction of 3% in 2008, a further contraction of 7% in 2009, and at the same time making a financial adjustment of 20 billion euros when you were spending about 60 billion, both in taxes and in expenditure cuts, uh, was clearly um, a policy mix that was never going to win universal acclaim, to put it mildly, but it had to be done. And the, the thing about leadership, too, is that you can't avoid decisions. There are certain decisions that mustn't be avoided. And it, the only consolation I had in that last few months as I was a Taoiseach Prime Minister, knowing that we weren't going to make it after the next election, was a statement made by one of our founding members of our party, a man called Frank Aiken, when he said, the party is important, but the state is paramount. And sometimes you've got to move beyond the partisan concerns of a politician and try and be the leader of a society in crisis. And that's what we had to do. And what has happened since then, in late 2010, we then had the fact that we had to get the IMF EU three-year deal in place, but we never compromised on maintaining a low corporate tax rate. And we also in ensured that whilst we cut current expenditure during those three years, we also made sure we had a capital expenditure program rebuilding infrastructure, 
investing particularly in research and development and innovation. And the, the Irish Development Authority, which is, if you like, the state-sponsored industrial promotions agency that works throughout the world for investment to come to Ireland, you can see that the long-term strategy is right because seven or eight years ago, probably 10% of the projects they got every year related to R&D and innovation. It's now 50%. So those companies who have invested in Ireland and came through the crisis with us in Ireland at the same time are reinvesting. They're reinvesting because the long-term strategy is correct. So when we had to set up a national ma asset management agency, for example, to take all of that bad debt out of the banks, recapitalize the banks, all of these were deeply unpopular measures because, as I say, the banks weren't exactly flavor of the month with those people who were finding themselves losing their homes and worse. But as I say, uh, without a banking system, we can't have a modern economy at all. But by 2010, the point is that by 2010, we were back with a, a positive balance of payments. And we were earning our place in the world, and we were also getting from 7% 7 to 7 decline in 2009, maybe 0.4% growth in 2010, and then increasing back up to 4 or 5% this year. And the present government, or the government before this one, are to be commended for continuing the policies that we set out. Because whilst in politics there's always an indication before an election there's an easy way of getting out of difficulty, we all know whether it's in manufacturing or whether it's you know, in the workplace or whatever we're doing, um, the fact is that there's very little room to manoeuvre when there's a crisis in place. So Ireland, if you like, have come through all of that. Uh, and even at the worst of the crisis, it's important to point out that we were still had employment that was one third higher than it was in 1997. So we had very fast growth, expanding the labour market, an employment of over two million people, and now thankfully we're back over that two million mark again in terms of employment and the economy. So that last four or five years have been extremely difficult, but they were necessary, they needed to be done, and leaders are required to look beyond their own concerns at a time of crisis. I think that's the basic point I want to make. And we are all capable of doing that, because I realized that my duty to the country at that stage wasn't my re-election. My duty to the country was to make sure that we had a country to which a government could be elected, uh, such was the existential threat that we faced. So from my point of view, with Brexit now a big issue, big issue for everyone in the global community because of the uncertainty that it causes. The British governments are clearly going to be leaving the European Union. The terms on which they leave will be difficult. The one thing we do know is that the benefits of non-membership will not exceed the benefits of membership, uh, certainly from an EU perspective. For Britain, of course, it has allowed them to see an effective devaluation of sterling. The exchange rate is something that's going to cause us problems because the strengthening of the euro against sterling is having a serious impact on our small and medium-sized enterprises who export primarily to Britain. But, you know, I, I don't agree with either the, doom there, the doomsayers who say it's going to be terrible, or I don't agree with those who say there'll be no problem at all. Somewhere in the middle is going to be the outcome. And like everything, like Darwin said, it's not the strongest who survive, but those who adapt best. And we will all have to adapt to that new uh, political reality that the British people have decided on. In relation to our own return to economic growth, as I say, we are get, we're back on the horse, as they say, back in the saddle and back moving forward again. And small countries have that benefit of being able to be flexible. It's like having a flotilla out in the bay. When the wind changes, you can turn a bit quicker than the tanker, although you'll never be as big as a tanker. But at least you can, you can move with the direction in which uh, in which the wind is now blowing and trying and try and uh, make sure that you, you survive in choppier waters. For Korea, I think there are great grounds for optimism. The Karolinska Institute in Sweden, Hans Rosling, the director there, makes a very good point upon which I'd like to leave the Korean audience. He says, when you look at the world population, the pin number is 1114. What does he mean by that? There's one billion in Europe, in Europe, there's one billion in the Americas, North America and South America, there's one billion in Africa, 
and there's 4 billion in Asia. If you look at 2050, the pin number will be 1125. There'll be an extra billion in Africa and an extra billion in Asia. And what's clear is that the wealth and technology gap, which has closed over the last 20 or 30 years, means that the, the position of economic power is changing. It could well be that the 21st century would be the Asian century. And for that being your neighborhood, that obviously puts you in a better position to thrive and survive than us out in the West Atlantic uh, in a in the European Union that at the moment is suffering from Eurosclerosis and needs some real quality leadership uh, to regain the initiative. But I do think that for Korea, building on its strengths, remaining open to trade, and the huge reforms that are taking place in education under Professor Hun and others, this is an example of a country that is very clearly aware of what's happening out there, the need to adapt to it, the need to put, bring forward reforms that will ensure that your people are best equipped to meet the new challenges. And looking to a younger generation that will increasingly have more than one career, that have three, four, five, six careers during their lifetime. And seeing education as a lifelong learning ex uh, experience with the technology changes that are coming, giving education a great opportunity to broaden its brief and to reach out far further than would have been the normal constituencies educationally that they would be looking to usually nationally. There's now an international yearning for knowledge and for those universities who can adapt to that and create the business model, of course, for that to work. That would be the key uh, in that respect. But overall, I think Korea has so much, has shown its strengths. And the one thing I would point out is that probably in the area of international services, when you look at the figures, given the size of your country and the size of ours, I think internationally traded services is one where Korea can move forward very quickly and they see it as a, a large component for growth in the future. Your manufacturing is way in excess of ours, obviously, and these are strengths that you'll build on in the future. So, can I thank you for, uh, for having me? I hope what I've had to say has been of some relevance. I think corporate leadership, like civic leadership, like public leadership, must be based on ethics and values that command the respect and support of the population we serve, whether it's in the corporate workplace or in society generally. And if we're to look to cohesion, having cohesion in our societies, uh, we, we need to make sure that our growth models are inclusive, that our regulatory systems are adequate and properly resourced, and that we have a pursuit to excellence which permeates all of what we do whether in the commercial or the private or the public world, that's the best way in which we can see uh, this coming together to the benefit of all our people. Ordinary people throughout the world aspire to a better time for their children than they have themselves. It's for us in leadership positions to make that not just an aspiration or a possibility, but making it real for them as well. Thanks very much indeed. Okay, thank you uh, for your very valuable yeah, Irish lesson to Korean economy and also the human resource development in Korea. And also both of us sh just uh, share the common elements of the, just like uh, uh, we are highly globalized economy and also uh, we just are yeah, based on the uh, high human resources in both countries and also we are just preparing for the next generation and uh, 21st century's new uh, leadership and uh, new human resources uh, from now on. And I'd like to just uh, yeah, ask some uh, questions and bring out some yeah, very interesting lessons. For example, uh, we are very globalized economy together, uh, but in terms of the export uh, goods, Korean economy is five times bigger than the island economy. But uh, on the contrast, uh, foreign direct investment, we receive only one third of your foreign direct investment. So probably it is because of the, uh, just like a North Korean discount or something like that. But still, in that sense, we are not that much, uh, what is a globalized economy. Uh, except uh, manufacturing. So 
how come you just uh, yeah, brings up some kind of uh, a bank or financial systems uh, liberalization is a very important measures uh, you after the world economic crisis you just uh, take and still we have a lot of problems of the uh, government regulation in the financial systems or something like that and what is your yeah, uh, suggestion for the financial uh, reaction to the yeah, globalized world economy uh, how to just increase the foreign direct investment yeah, in Korea yeah we've been we've been reasonably successful in that area I think as, as I say one of the reasons is because outside investment from outside Europe looking for um, a location to be a platform for a single market is, is a, a major factor. Having a fiscal environment that's pro-business is certainly a factor. 12.5% corporation tax rate. That's transparent and in line with all international treaties. And also, um, when you talk to people about why they're reinvesting, and they're reinvesting you know, serious money, the PayPals and the the pharmaceuticals, all the top people in pharmaceuticals, IT, are all located there, not exclusively there, obviously, but they're, they have a very, very strong presence in Ireland that they have, they do talk, keep talking about the people. The quality of the people is what's dictating because we're competing against just like Korea or Singapore or Israel for these sort of investments if they're coming outside the States or wherever they're, they're located originally. There's also the point that, you know, International trade has changed. I mean, just-in-time production, customized products. One time in the 60s, multinationals were saying, you know, they have a big centralized manufacturing plant, or two or three plants maybe in the States, and then ship out. They now, because of the nature of the consumer demands that are facing them, the need for customized products, the need for service, proper service, servicing of these products, subsequent after sales products, and all that. That is something that um, means that uh, you know, investments in places like Ireland become more rational for those co co companies than would have been the case 20 or 30 years ago. There's also the point that, um, you know, the overall tonnage of goods is changing too. I mean, Greenspan made the point that there was a reduction in tonnage of goods going out of the States at one point. And he said that was really about, you know, people are exporting computers rather than coal, is the simple way he put it. So in other words, the quality per weight of product has changed so that the whole question of transportation costs, which were traditional cost factors in the past, given the type of product there is and the quality and, and, and value of those products now, um, the tyranny of distance is no longer as big a factor because of the location of plants in countries closer to those markets than would have been the case in the past and the value of those products in any event in terms of the transportation costs not being as big a component. So when you look at the terms of international trade, when you look at all of these developments, I would still say that the main factor that I hear from people who directly invest in Ireland is its people. I'm sure it's the same in Korea, it's the same elsewhere, in, in whatever other you know, area of expertise that you've developed. Uh, and that's the main reason, I think. Okay, thank you. And, uh Probably you just mentioned that a number of yeah, elements, for example, the, uh, your regional position in the yeah, EU market is very good niche for your country. And also you just developed a, <coughs> excuse me, a very state-of-the-art technology and the human resources is very important. So you have achieved, uh, compared to other industrialized countries, almost every year, 5%, uh, more than 5% of the GDP increase is a marvelous, yeah, among the in, in, just the, yeah, industrialized countries. And just back to <clears throat> our human resources issues, uh, you agree, uh, yeah, with me in terms of the, in the fourth industrialize, uh, industrialization, industrial revolution, and we need to develop the better human resources in the 21st century. So the university needs to change and also the education system needs to be changed. For example, uh, the Albert Einstein mentioned in this way, uh, imagination is more important than knowledge. So simply transfer knowledge is not enough. It is very good for the 20th century for the mass production and manufacturing. But in the 21st century, we need a better 
and much uh, innovative, yeah, talented human resources. So, what can be the uh, just a, yeah, a goal for the university and the, what the university uh, education uh, needs to be changed. Yeah. Well, I agree that, that universities are, are a hugely important resource in any society where we teach our young is, is, and the whole esteem in which teaching is held in society is a very important component in the quality of our education system, the quality of our teachers, the quality of people who are interested in teaching. So it's important that society gives a respect to education as a field of activity in itself, quite apart from um, you know, whatever policies or resources you apply to it. You need quality people to provide a quality education. Um, and universities now, of course, there's been a lot of this argument between the academic role of universities um, and, if you like, the more utilitarian concept of preparing people for the workplace. And I, personally, I believe in educating our people first and then developing. I spoke to a head guy in Ericsson one time who was in Ireland, and I said, who are your main guys who, who produce new products? And he said, it's not the guys who are the computer software scientists at all. It's not, not those guys. It could be a guy with a liberal arts degree. Or a, he, just, he comes to the thing conceptually from a different point of view and from a, a less specific te technically uh, point of view. So, that was an interesting observation. So I think, you know, there is a great value still in a broad education for our people in the first instance, because a lot of kids, I certainly didn't know what I wanted to do at 17 or 18 years of age. I don't think many do. And the maturation process when you're 21 or two is a totally different thing and you have a far better idea based on having learned in, in, in university what, what it is you want to do. But I think the, the way universities are providing greater range of choice now, where in my time, and for many people who are here maybe, you know, you did law or you did engineering or you did medicine. Now you can do modules and languages and technical subjects and whatever it is you want. There's great variety and great choice. Um, and I think that's, that's a huge opportunity for the young generation to adapt. Yeah, for the 20th century, we need to specialize our knowledge. There's a major and we need to learn <clears throat> some knowledge from the universities. But in the 21st century, we need to change our education system to simply transfer knowledge to the students, but uh, just uh, uh, increase our muscles to solve the social problems and the, some kind of technical problems. So as you mentioned that, uh, not based on the majors or specific knowledge, but based on how to solve the problem, how to just to cooperate with other people together and uh, just a yeah, innovative way. That is yes. very important. So we need to change our yeah, education system. And also that is one thing in, the, in terms of education. And second thing is that in the university function is not only the education, but also the knowledge creation. For example, research is very important. So in most cases in these days, our, for example, the QS evaluation, they emphasize the research. So in that case, how to collaborate with uh, industry, uh, just uh, yeah, how to adjust to the social change, uh, the university, research and knowledge creation related to the social demands is very important. So education and research, the two functions are very important. One is knowledge transfer and create the muscles to how to solve the problem in a society for the youngsters. And second thing is that for the professor, they create the knowledge to serve the industrial demands. The two points are very important. And what is your... Yeah. Yes, and again, I agree. I mean, from, from a resource point of view and a government point of view, you know, you need to see some applied research as well as a lot of this blue skies research. You've also got to make sure, and we did it in Ireland, where you had five or six universities competing for, for, for resources, to insist on a greater degree of collaboration. You can't have every university dealing with things as if it's a standalone entity. You just don't have the resources to do that. And so if you have a criterion for in terms of eligibility for assistance or for, for research grants or whatever, that that requires 30% you know, of the points for what level of collaboration are you undertaking, either with a university in Ireland or indeed elsewhere, so that the academic community is being interlinked and being the greater use of the resources being applied as efficiently as possible. That's, a, that's another way in which public policy makers can, 
can insist that if we are going to spend money in research, and we do, I think we spend about 3% of our GMP on, on, on research, you've got to be able to prepare to insist on the academic community having some discipline in what, it, what it's trying to achieve, so that the outputs can be measured, and you can know what to, what to devote more resources to where you have success, and to move on to other areas where you haven't had success. So that ability to, 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 to uh, quality assure what you're doing in education is just as important as in the production line in industry or anywhere else. But I also think that, you know, I take your point that we need to make sure, that, and our young people are feeling this too, there's too much terminology about the economy in terms of human development. We need to get back to um, recognizing that, you know, developing our culture, that we have, we have a cultural industry in Ireland now based on film and on literature and, on literature and all of that. So that there are people who are working in these are industries, the film industry is a very labor intensive industry. Uh, you can get people with many technical gifts and skills to get to work there. So again, if you set up the fiscal environment in terms of encouraging filmmakers to come to Ireland, that gives you a much larger imprint, a much, mar much larger footprint in, in world culture subsequently. And people associate Ireland with that sort of, uh, some successful um, films that have been done there. Also, in music, you know, people like U2, Bono, all of these are cultural icons for, for a, a global generation, not just a generation at home. Uh, and again, countries must use these uh, cultural um, examples as, as means of promoting the country, as a means of communicating for people to come, for tourists, for tourists to come to Ireland, create an, uh, an, inqu an inquiry about the country and create a, an idea that here's somewhere we'd like to visit if it's producing these type of people. So getting away from the terminology of economics all the time and, and talking about these societal issues of, that will encourage tourism and cultural exchange and indeed create jobs in the economic sense as well in, in, in diverse creative industries and audiovisual visual industries and all that. That's, that's another important footprint for a country because of the impact it has uh, way beyond the normal markets that one would be operating in with traditional goods and services. So all of that is, is, is I think, and finally to say that, you know, from my point of view, whilst it's got a, a bit of a bad name during the crisis, I'm still a great advocate of social partnership. We, we had three year rolling national programs over the last 30 years, where you bring in the sectional interests, the organized sectional interests, like trade unions, employers, the farm organizations, the non-government, the NGO sector, and government, discussing and trying to create a consensus around where the general, uh, what the general direction of the country should be, what are the realistic budgetary parameters in which everyone can compete for funds, and get people to understand that obviously you can't get everything done today, and yes, you've got to set out priorities. It has to make sense to people. It has, they have to see a sort of a holistic view of public policy to which they can subscribe. That's, that increases participation in your democratic structures. It increases uh, people's sense of ownership of the problems as well as the solutions. Uh, and also it creates a societal uh, solidarity uh, where people who are on the weaker and the margins that there is priority given in social policy terms to bring greater equity and equality for those people and boosting opportunity for, for traditional sectors of society which have been denied it in the past. That's, a hugely important uh, political challenge. Uh, and too often this idea where populists now talk about democratic governments being elitist. I mean, you have governments in democracies as governments because they have sufficient support within their society. The elitists are often those on the margins uh, and the more, who take more extreme positions who try to portray those who are democratically accountable as being elitist. And that sort of terminology is being allowed to be used in social media, in the media generally, because people like to create this confrontational idea, this sort of black and white approach uh, to public affairs where you're either all right or all wrong. The fact of the matter is we all know life is different. Commercial life is different and public life should be no different. So having accountable mechanisms, increasing participation of society's interests, identifying a general and national interest to which all other sectional priorities should uh, submit itself, if you like, that creates solidarity, it creates a sense of society, uh, and, and giving as much importance to, as I say, cultural activities as a means of creating jobs, as well as the more narrow, normal economic discussion 
these are all important ways in getting young people uh, to see that uh, the public space is somewhere where we need quality people as well and not something that's an optional extra. Uh, you know, that sense of public service is only something that can come back when democratic institutions are seen to be uh, working and applying rigour to their work rather than pass uh, slogans that mean nothing to people and simply uh, disorient people and, and make them feel that this is, this is not for me, whereas citizen participation is critical. Yeah, you, you just mentioned that uh, just the two points. That the first one is that uh, uh, very creative yeah, atmosphere is needed for the youngsters, and that is one thing. And the second part is that uh, a new innovative policy uh, measures are important. The first one is that uh, surely in Korea we have still understand the problem. We still uh, think that education is labor and hard work and the uh, road memorization and simply learn something uh, and then take a test and that's it. But we need to change this kind of education system and we need to be more innovative. As you mentioned, the film industry and the uh, uh, music or whatever, and they can develop their own industry and the very creative economy in the 21st century. That is very uh, important factor. So uh, university education needs to be changed and we simply provide some kind of, uh, uh, as I said, yeah, muscles to uh, just adapt to that kind of environmental changes and then uh, develop their own uh, talent and uh, their, uh, their capacity uh, to contribute to, to the new industry. That is one thing. And the second thing is that you mentioned that uh, uh, even the public uh, services or the bureaucracy or government policies need to be changed and uh, not simply the slogan and ideology, but more practical ways. We need to be more flexible and innovative to encourage and boost up that kind of yeah, atmosphere. That is, ecosystem is, uh, needs to be changed. So, yes, uh, I, think, I yeah. think the big, I mean, what I'd say to you is that I find in public, the biggest resistors to change are often the service providers. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about change in education, yeah, teachers need to change. Yeah, you, teachers yeah. need to change. Yeah. Students are willing to change if they get the opportunity. I mean, probably the next generation to me is far more open to it than, because they see change as being a constant in their lives. It's not a careers, okay, let's have five or six careers. Let's travel if we want to travel. No, they have a different approach to life, to, whereas when we were growing up in the 70s and the 80s, you know, get a job, hold on to it. Your parents would kick you out of house and home. If you get home and say, I give up a job, I'm going off for a six-month sabbatical in kibbutz in Israel, think you're out of your mind. You know? I mean, it's people think differently, and, this, and the generations that have power now need to address how they exercise power to that generation. Um, and, and just as the private sector has to deal with major disruptive forces that are coming in, getting people to rethink how they're going to keep the, in the business that looked like, you know, being very settled for the next 10 or 15 years. Suddenly, if a disrupt, like what happened to the CD business or whatever, a disruption comes in from iTunes, that's it, game over. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we need, our public services need to be as, as uh, flexible and our public bureaucracies need to recognize that it's not, you're not diluting the ethos of public service or the availability of services to the people by insisting on it being done in the most efficient and effective way possible. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the way private sector has to operate. And one of the dislocations between, I, I acknowledge, between the private sector and the public sector, is private sector people get very frustrated when they see unchanging bureaucracies, when they see um, people not making the changes that others have to make who are out there in the marketplace, because if they don't, they, you know, they, they go by the wayside and they have to get another career. Uh, and I think those who are committed to public service have to be open to this flexibility, to look to new models of service delivery, and not to think that the way we produced the health service in the 1960s is going, to be, is going to be adequate for the way you deal with a 21st century health service. It clearly, patently, can't be done. Neither can you apply the, the, the foremost technologies in medicine to every hospital in the country. You've got to find a strategic way of doing things, and you've got to bring the people with you. And, and that sort of, so the public debate, there's plenty of room and opportunity to have rigorous, interesting debates about how we provide basic services that are important for how people live in our society on an everyday basis, rather than uh, reducing it, a reductionist approach to 
who has the best soundbite today. I mean, the media have to take on a responsibility here. And I think social media, you know, for all its benefits, I mean, we, this, to hide behind the anonymity of some of the vitriol that you see directed at personalities and at issues in social media is very, very debilitating and very disrespectful of the public space. And, yeah. I, and I think that everyone who's interested in having a vibrant, inclusive society need to challenge these trends in whatever way they can because it, it coarsens public debate. We're seeing it, you know, in some, in some debates, those of us who keep an eye on politics in other parts of the world, the court, to, to have a coarse, uh, unsophisticated public debate serves nobody, only usually demagogues and people who aren't, um, who, who may not have the wider public interest at heart at the end of the day. Yeah, I got an impression that in Ireland and you uh, have already Adapt to, adapted to the yeah, changes of the environment and then very rapidly and because uh, thanks to your country is small and relatively easy to change the system. But in Korea, well, it is a, not, not in Korea alone, but uh, for example, the conventional and very traditional organization, it is very difficult to change, just like a university or bureaucracy. So there's a joke in Korea, for example, the world famous yeah, leader stars, just like golf stars and the figure stars, they don't have any official education yeah, controlled by the Ministry of Education. So, uh, and also in Korea, K-pop and K-drama, K-culture, Korea culture is a worldly renowned phenomenon in these days, but they are not trained in the official education system. So in that sense, uh, we need to change very rapidly. So for example, the minds of parents should be changed, for example, in the United States, some university uh, takes, uh, takes very seriously esports. The game sports is very important. They develop games and uh, they just uh, recruit the students, provide a scholarship, the pro gamers, the yes. sports yeah, e gamers. So, new industry is uh, developing in various ways, but still, we stick to the 20th century mind. So, we need to change. So, uh, the one, one thing I'd like to suggest that is that uh, uh, still we need to expand our horizon is that the globalization. For example, uh, Korea, thanks to our uh, tradition of education, uh, a lot of people uh, went out, have, have gone outside and to get a PhD from United States or some other yeah, countries. So we have a much more globalized in that sense. But in European countries or American countries, they are very reluctant to go outside, for example, to come to Korea and experience the Korean culture and Asian culture. So from now on, uh, EU countries and also the Korea, even Korea, we develop some kind of dual degree systems. If you uh, stay and take the courses three years in your home institution, home university, and then get one year from, for example, my university, Korean university, then we can provide the bachelor degree uh, to that students. We recognize the three years uh, education in your country. So this kind of global, yeah, just a, yeah, yeah, internationalization is very important even in the education. What is your, yeah? Well, I mean, I agree, I mean, quickly, I mean, the international mutual recognition of, of, of standards is hugely important in terms of mobility of labor, of labor force. And also, I think that, you know, in an internationalized world, the globalized world we live in, we find that we have a resource out there in the diaspora. I mean, there are many people of Irish descent in America who are leaders in their field and industry, and, and we use them, and we use them very well. I mean, my predecessor of mine in the 90s set up what's called the U U.S. Economic Advisory Board. I think, you know, where we have many Koreans, eminent Koreans, and, and doctorates in Stanford and everywhere else, who haven't yet come back or hopefully will be back soon, some of them. I mean, there is a resource there to be used about best practice, about what's happening in the future. People are at the, at the forefront of industrial and, and, uh, and societal trends. Uh, all of these, you know, there are people out there with information who are sympathetic to your country if they're from the nation who are from, who are, or who have an affiliation with the, with the country or their grandparents or whatever. And all of those people are anxious to help. All they want to do is to be asked. And many of them will provide information free and for nothing. Mm. Uh, we had, I remember when we modernized our telecommunication system, 
We had guys of Irish, of Irish ancestry in some of the top uh, corporations in the States, and they were able to provide the Prime Minister's office with information, uh, advice, free and for nothing. But you'd pay a lot of money to, if you've got McKinsey or someone to try and do it. They probably wouldn't give it to you as quickly or in, in, in as business-like a way as business people could do. So, you know, these are, you've got to use every resource you can to be, there are people out there who are supportive, who are, it's, you've got to keep an eye on them, find out where they are. Some countries are very good at, with their diaspora work, who, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and others are, are not so good. But we, it's something that we've come to organize in a way that makes a lot of economic sense, as well as simply just the idea of maintaining a, a tangential relationship with the old yeah, country. Global network. Yeah. A global network, exactly. And I think that's important. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from all those points of view, it's good business sense. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, a lot of countries are doing that now in a more organized way. OK, yeah. Because we are running out of time, my final yeah, question, or I'd like to ask you your advice or yeah, something like that. Because we have a number of uh, president of the Korean prestigious universities attended this yeah, early session, and could you? Well, my yeah, 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 yeah. Otherwise, one. The my experience the, with university professors is very simple. <laughs> you provide a carrot and a stick. A carrot you and a show stick. them a carrot; they eat the carrot and forget about the stick. You show them a stick; they'll walk out the door and do nothing for you. Yeah. So what you got to do is, you know, getting. I see universities in Ireland as a national resource and indeed an international resource, and encouraging, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to put it that way, in the inverted commas, encouraging collaboration mm -hmm. and avoiding these sort of little republics to be set up where every, <laughs> all the, the can't see outside their own university wall and at the same time talk about a globalized world. Yeah. And won't, so I won't talk to their neighbor 20, yards up, 20 miles up the road because he happens to be head of another university and he has to be bigger than him. Mm -hmm. So if we could, like politicians, if we can keep their egos under control, mm -hmm. they can do a lot of good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, finally, one more thing for the Korean young students and the, the topic is a dream and vision and creation or something like this. So uh, for yeah, Korean young students and what is your advice? Well, I'm not here, I'm not, as I say, I'm not here to say we've the answers. We've got the problems that you guys <laughs> never had. Um, I would say, you know, there's no doubt that I get a great sense from my own daughters that traveling, they want to see the world, they want mm -hmm. to get out and experience diversity. Unfortunately, we're seeing in the modern world what I feel is sort of this bland homogeneity in terms of media and all of that. Where people want, you know, they want to uh, apply their minds to, to, to a greater sense of wonder out there about the world. Uh, and that can only be done by having the cultural exchanges we're talking about. They're often poo-pooed as, oh, that's just by the way. It's not. I think it's important. Cultural exchange is very important. Educational exchange is very important. Mm -hmm and being open, and I'm glad that you'll be coming to Ireland on a visit at the request of our own ambassador in November, and I hope that you find from your colleagues that uh, you'll be able to speak a language that you can both work on and get more Koreans to come to Ireland and more Irish to come to Korea, because mm -hmm. as I say, it's, not, it's, not, it's a small world now. We can get around very quickly, and um, yeah. I would just say to them, yeah. uh, participate in your society, and it's not a, it's not a very um, popular thing to say, but participate in your politics too, because we need good people running our countries as well as our public administrations as much as we need good sustainable industries and good ethical leaders in the private sector. Okay, and uh, thank you for your very interesting and very valuable ideas and uh, very yeah, positive way to look to the future. And uh, especially the last part of you mentioned uh, uh, to know the world and to expose to the world. And I'm going to visit yeah, Alan late November and then meet a number of university uh, just, uh, yeah, administrators. And then we can just make some kind of exchange programs. And then we bring a lot of Irish students to Korea and we bring Korean students to uh, yeah, Ireland. And then uh, this kind of a uh, new innovative way is very important for the 21st century. Thanks for your valuable comments and ideas and presentation. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
과연 리더십이 우리 사회를 위해서 어떤 역할을 할수 있을지 또 어떤 중요성을 갖고 있는지 함께 논의해보는 아주 중요한 시간이었습니다. 기조 연설을 위해서 방안을 해주셨는데요. 브라이언 카원 전 아일랜드 총리님 그리고 대담자로 수고를 해주신 염재호 총장님께도 다시 한번 감사드리겠습니다. 네, 그럼 계속해서 두 번째 기조 연설 청해 듣도록 하겠습니다. 엘렌 랭어 미국 하버드대 교수님을 모시고 저성장 사회 그리고 진취적 도전 정신이라는 주제로 두 번째 기조 연설 진행하도록 하겠습니다. 여러분 큰 박수로 환영해 주시기 바랍니다. We can start while they are rearranging the furniture, right? It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, what I want to do is to talk to you about this concept that I've been researching for close to 40 years. And in order for you to fully understand it, the best thing is for you to play along. Right? So you'll have the experience of what I'm talking about. And I think then you'll be more likely to be persuaded of the cost of this mindlessness um, that I believe is pervasive. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that virtually all of us are mindless almost all of the time. Right? After we do that, then we'll explore the power of possibility and see potential solutions to the problems you just heard about and other problems that you're faced with on a daily basis. And we do all this in the service of getting ourselves to stop using yesterday's solutions to solve today's problems. So let's begin. I need you to play along now, so we're going to add these numbers. 1,000. 1,040, 2,040, 2,070, 3,070, 3,090, 4,090, 4,090. For those of you who still don't know what happened, you added 4,090 plus 10, which the way I was taught arithmetic was 4,100, and came up with 5,000. Right. And if I didn't correct you, you'd have no idea that you were wrong. And I'm suggesting that this happens virtually all the time. Um, for those of you who are over, let's say, 45, maybe 50, and snow and ice, and you're driving in your car, and the car starts to skid, what do you do? Well, what most of you will say is that you gently press the brakes to regain control of the car. Now, that made sense years ago before there were anti-lock brakes. So for safety's sake, what you would do is gently hit the brakes. Now, in order to be safe, what you need to do is firmly hit the brakes. And the point of this is that mindlessness is not stupidity. It made sense at time one when we first learned it. We keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. In the meantime, circumstances are slowly changing. And at some point, we get caught unawares. I was in this store, and I gave the merchant my credit card to make a purchase. And she noticed that it wasn't signed, so she asked me to sign it. I signed it. She then ran it through the credit card machine and gave me the credit card slip to sign. I signed it. She then compared the two signatures. Having just signed both of them in front of her, it would have been strange if they didn't match. And the reason I tell you this is that we're unaware of our own mindlessness. When we're mindless, we're mindless. We're not there to know that we're not there. But if I had more time, I'd give you more examples to show you how mindless you are so you'd come away with the realization that this is potentially costly. Because when we're mindless, we can't avert the danger not yet arisen or take advantage of opportunities that if we were only there, we'd see right before ourselves. And no matter what you're doing, you're doing it mindlessly or mindfully, no matter what. Now, I'm an academic, as you learned, from Harvard, so I can't tell you what I really think in print. But just among us, when I say most of our suffering, I mean all. That's a very big statement. 
all of our suffering, whether personal, interpersonal, professional, <coughs> or global, is the direct or indirect effect of our mindlessness. For over 35 years, we've done studies where we easily teach people to be mindful, and we measure their health, well-being, their productivity, and so on. And what we find, and this is just a few of um, the findings that we have. No matter what we put into the equation, we seem to get an advantage, a strong advantage to being mindful. The earliest studies were done with old people. We taught them to be mindful, and we found that they lived longer. All right. When I'm talking about mindlessness, when I'm talking about an inactive state of mind where we're relying on distinctions, categories, <coughs> excuse me, that were drawn in the past. So the past is taking over the present. We're trapped in a single perspective. We're insensitive to context. <coughs> excuse me, our rules and routines govern what we do. And this typically happens by default rather than by design. Mindfulness, it's amazing to think of how simple this is when you realize the slide I showed you two slides ago, the consequences of being mindful. All you need to do is actively notice new things. Doesn't matter if what you notice is smart, <coughs> is relevant, is silly, as long as it's new, that puts you in the present. Now you have lots of people in folk psychology will say, be in the moment. It's really um, an empty instruction because, again, when you're not there, you're not there to know you're not there. This is the way to be there. You notice new things that puts you in the present, makes you aware of context and perspective. You can still have rules and routines, but they guide what you're doing rather than overly determine what you're doing. And this process of noticing new things is the essence of engagement. So what that means and what the results of these studies after study have found is that it's literally and figuratively enlivening. So it's so easy that there's no reason why more of us shouldn't incorporate this in our workplaces, certainly in our schools, where it's very easy to turn education around from where students are memorizing or bored to death or stressed to an environment where they're actually enjoy enjoying what they're doing and setting themselves up to be innovative. What happens is you notice new things, then you see, gee, I didn't know this thing I thought I knew as well as I thought I knew it. Then your attention naturally goes to it. So mindlessness is pervasive. As I said, I think virtually all of us are mindless most of the time. We think we know, but we don't. And a simple way of remembering this is that we're frequently in error, for like for those of you who said 5,000, but rarely in doubt. It's not just that our mindlessness, our mindfulness rather, improves our health and performance. It's actually visible to other people. When we're there, when we're present, people know. People find us charismatic. People see us as attractive. People trust us. So in a simple study we did years ago, we had magazine salesmen learn a sales pitch, and they were going to learn it and then give it in the way they had memorized it, Vers versus the mindful group that were told to say the same thing, but to make it new in very subtle ways that only they would know. So they go out and sell magazines. After they sell the magazine or not, somebody else comes to the client to find out what they thought of the salesperson. Well, it turns out when the salesperson was mindful, they sold more magazines, and they were evaluated as more charismatic. And I think the simple presence that comes from noticing is the essence of charisma. We've done research on women in leadership. And women, as you might know, as far as leadership is concerned, have a strange problem. That if they're strong and effective, they're often seen as bitches. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> OK. And if they're warm and female-like and um, caring, they're seen as weak. So what is a woman to do? Well, it turns out 
that we take women and we have them be mindful or mindless while they're being male-like or female-like. And it turns out that it doesn't matter <coughs> what the trappings are. As long as they're mindful, they're seen as charismatic and trustworthy. So our mindfulness seems to be visible. It's attractive to other people. And again, I believe it's the essence of effective leadership. It's also visible in the products that we create. This is interesting, because I'm going to try to open this. You know, I am a genius. So you have to recognize that being able to do one thing doesn't mean you can do all things. I did it. Okay. All right. So interestingly, our mindfulness is recognizable in the products that we create. I started to paint about 20 years ago without knowing what I was doing, and I was having a wonderful time. You see, this is sort of a dog in sort of a chair. And the point is that I put my whole heart and soul in what I was doing, and the question is, does it leave its imprint in these paintings? It just, this is kind of fun for me. We have, these are very large canvases, and these are deeply psychological. So here is a dog playing solitaire when he has two other dogs he could be playing with. Okay, you have to appreciate the depth of some of these. In the United States, we have a bus company called the Greyhound Bus. This is a Greyhound Bus, a bus driven by a Jack Russell full of greyhounds. Maybe these don't translate well into Korean, but it's fun for me regardless. Just one more. You know the Sharpay, the wrinkle dog? This is before and after surgery. Okay. All right, so the question I was asking is, is our mindfulness available on the canvas, or is it simply in the eye of the beholder? And it turns out to be both. And we've done lots of studies where we have people draw something, copy it, copy it again, versus draw, copy it, this time make it new in very subtle ways that only you would know. Mix them up, have people tell us what they prefer. No matter what the kind of product we're talking about, when it's mindfully created, it's the product that people most prefer. But I think the most interesting of these studies, because it speaks indirectly to leadership, is our studies with symphony orchestras. What we did was to take these orchestras, and the mindless group was going to be asked Remember a time you played this piece where you really enjoyed your performance and just tried to replicate it. The mindful group is told, make it new in very subtle ways that only you would know. Now it's very important they're playing classical music, so it had to be subtle, otherwise it would be hard on the ear. So as in all the studies, one group is doing it same old, same old, one group is making it new. We record the performances, and then we play it for people who have no idea about the study, and just ask them if they hear a difference and which they prefer, and then we question the musicians about their enjoyment in playing the pieces. People hear the difference, they overwhelmingly prefer the mindfully played piece, and the musicians prefer playing this way. Now there was a result in this study that's hidden result relevant to leadership that I didn't realize until I wrote this paper up for publication, which is by having everybody do it their own way, you ended up with superior coordinated experience. That's kind of interesting, right? Because for those of us on top, we think that what we have to do is dictate every step of the way what people should do. So results like this <coughs> excuse me, lead me to believe that the main job of a leader is to increase the employee's mindfulness. And I would say the same thing in an academic setting, that the main job of the professor is to increase the mindfulness of the students. We have lots of research on innovation, many of the things you just learned about in the last hour. And for each of those, simply letting people, encouraging people, enabling people to be more mindful 
rather than to learn in this rote way that all of us have learned, um, has enormous consequences, both for the individual and for the culture. But the consequences of increasing our mindfulness go even beyond what I've said. All of our facts become suspect. Let me tell you what I mean by this. I was at a horse event many years ago. This man asked me, would I watch his horse because he was going to go get his horse a hot dog? I'm Harvard-Yale all the way through. I know this is ridiculous. Horses are herbivorous. They do not eat meat. He came back with the hot dog, and the horse ate it. It was at that moment that I realized everything that I had memorized to become a very young full professor at Harvard. Everything was possibly wrong. And then I thought about it and realized science doesn't give us absolute facts. Science only gives us probabilities. If we, the probabilities say that if we were to run the exact same study, the exact same way, which we never can, we are likely to get the same findings. These are then reported in textbooks and lectures by people as absolutes. Absolutes, not many horses under some circumstances don't eat meat. Horses don't eat meat. All of our facts become suspect. If I said to you, for example, and I do say to you, how much is one in one? I've scared you? How much is one in one? OK. Brian Cohen says two. Is he the only one? All right, well, it's good to, to hesitate, because it turns out that one in one isn't always two. If you're using the base 10 number system, one plus one is two. If you're using a base ten, uh, two number system, one plus one is written as 10. If you're adding one watt of chewing gum to one watt of chewing gum, one plus one is one. You add one pile of snow to one pile of snow, one plus one is one. One pile of laundry to one, you know. I'm not sure that one in one is two as often as most of us think. And the point, again, is that we've learned these things in a particular context. We assume we're right, so we don't pay any attention. And in doing that, we give up all sorts of possibilities. So facts are just decisions that were made in uncertainty from a particular perspective. The moment we make that decision, we forget that there was all that uncertainty. And now we think we know. And when we think we know, we no longer question or pay any attention to how it might be other. I want to raise something in discussing this psychology of possibility. I want to know why we're so sure we can't improve vision beyond 2020. Just think ourselves thin. Reverse virtually all brain damage. Why are we so sure we can't run a stress-free company? or a nation where everyone prospers, or have students learn and be innovative without uh, fears of boredom, at worst, suicide. Why can't that be? We need to free ourselves from the constricting mindsets and the limits they place on us. And I want to now talk to you about some of these limits in this new view of health. First, I want to appeal to um, both Schopenhauer and Einstein. Schopenhauer said, all research passes through three phases. First, it's ridiculed. Second, it's violently opposed. Third, it's accepted as self-evident. Because I'm going to present something to you that on the face of it is so simple, but there will be people who outright reject it. And then we can come back here in 10 years, and you'll see how everybody will assume it's all self-evident. Einstein said, if an idea at first isn't absurd, there's no hope for it. So what is this idea? It's so simple. I don't know how many of you have heard there's a mind-body problem. And what the mind-body problem is, 
how do you get from this fuzzy thing called a thought to something material called the body? And in trying to figure out how you get from the immaterial to the material, we've overlooked um, some great possibility for our health and well-being. So I want to argue, let's take mind and body and just put them back together. And if we put them back together, the problem goes away, because then wherever we're putting the mind, we're necessarily putting the body. So I've done a series of studies with my students where we put the mind in strange places, take the measurements from the body to test this theory. The first one some of you may know about because it was replicated in South Korea is called the counterclockwise study. This was a study where we took old men, and they were old. We ran this study in 1979, and that's when an 80-year-old was old, not the new 60. And what we were going to do is have them live in a retreat that we had retrofitted to 20 years earlier. They were going to discuss topics, see movies, everything from that past as if it was just happening right now. So we're putting the mind back in time and taking our measures from the body. We had a comparison group that also lived in this retreat for a week, also discussed the same topics, saw the same films, and so on. But for them, they were reminiscing. It was always clear that now was now, and then was then. And what did we find? Because all of the participants lived for a week in this novel, mindfulness-inducing environment, we got improvements first in both groups. Hearing. When was the last time you heard somebody's hearing improve? These are all statistically significant findings. Their hearing improved, their strength improved. Over and above that, for the mindful group, the group, the experimental group, rather, the group we had live as if it was this 20 years earlier, their vision improved. We took photographs of people before the start of the study and then at the end and had people again who knew nothing about the study evaluate them. And what they concluded was those in the experimental group looked noticeably younger than in the comparison group. They didn't look 20 years younger but still younger. All right, so now we go on and do this um, in other circumstances to test this mind-body unity. So we take chambermaids. Now, you all know chambermaids are these women who are working in hotels, motels. All day long, they're doing exercise. The first thing we do is ask them, how much exercise are you getting? And surprisingly, they say they're not getting exercise because they think exercise is what you do after work. So we take half of them, and we're going to teach them. We say, making a bed is like working in this machine at the gym, and so on. So we take half of them and persuade them that their work is exercise. That's all, it's the only difference, okay? We take a lot of measures before they start. We also take measures at the end of this month or six weeks, I don't remember. And we say, is she working any harder than she was before? Are you eating any more or less? No differences on those measures. All that's different is one group sees themselves as exercising and the other group doesn't. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, what I'm telling you is that this woman in pink, if she has a sense of herself as spending the whole day at the gym, even if she's not exercising, but in her mind, being at the gym means she is exercising, she will lose weight. Here's what we found. Those who see their work as exercise lost weight. There was a decrease in body mass index, a decrease in waist to hip ratio, and their blood pressure came down. All with this change in mindset. Now, I know this is the way in Korea and around the globe we assess vision. And for most people, when you go into the doctor's office and you read an eye chart, that's all there is to it. For me, being strange, this says to me, somebody is expecting that soon I'm not going to be able to see because the letters get smaller and smaller. So I said, okay, 
What if we reverse that? So now the expectation is, soon I will be able to see because the letters are getting larger and larger. What happens now, people can see what they couldn't see before. Now most people have the view around two-thirds of the way down the chart, you're going to have trouble seeing the letters. So what we did was take a chart and begin a third of the way down. So two-thirds of the way down are now much smaller letters. And again, people can see what they couldn't see before. Now, there's something about vision that's very similar to what we do in most walks of life, but certainly with respect to the medical world. You go into a doctor's office looking at letters that make no sense, you're given a number, and you assume that's the way you see. I don't know about you, but if I'm hungry, I can see the restaurant sign a lot sooner than if I'm not hungry. I see better in the morning than I do late at night, and so on. Things are always changing, but the medical world, our universities and lower schools that teach us to memorize, are teaching us to hold things still. Control over our lives, over our worlds, will come from accepting, noticing the way things more naturally vary, rather than hold them still. Uh, there was another slide that was supposed to be here, let me just tell it to you, which was the recent work that uh, Chanmo Park and I did on diabetes. And I think this speaks to um, many diseases. And the bottom line is going to be that we have far more control over disease than we may realize. So what we did was to take people who have type 2 diabetes, they show up for the study, we give them lots of tests. Then they're going to sit at a computer, next to the computer is a clock. For a third of the people, the clock is going twice as fast as real time. For a third of the people, the clock is going half as fast as real time. For a third of the people, it's real time. The question we're asking is, will blood sugar level follow real or perceived time? And the answer was perceived time, which means that we can, without medical intervention, learn how to control our blood sugar level and hence our diabetes. There are several studies that we have going on now where we, um, we can call them attention to symptom variability. What happens is you go to the doctor, you're given a diagnosis of a chronic disease, for example, and then you just expect everything to unfold in a predictable way. And you never tune in again to how you're actually feeling, except when you're supposed to take a medication <coughs> or do something else the doctor ordered. We have this now with ALS, MS, arthritis, chronic pain. We're testing it right now with asthma and depression, where we have people pay attention to the variability in their symptoms. Nothing ever stays the same. Nothing. When we confuse the stability of our mindsets with the stability of the underlying phenomenon, we mistakenly think things are still. By recognizing that these symptoms change, sometimes they're better, sometimes they're worse, then in the important groups we ask people, well, why is it better or worse? Now what happens is by trying to solve that problem, you become more mindful, which years and years of our data say is good for your health, and you may actually come up with a solution. So let's just say, for example, you have asthma. Now, right now, if you have asthma, what you will do when you need the inhaler is use the inhaler. That's the beginning and the end of it. If you were in one of our studies, we'd say, OK, when do you need that inhaler? And it turns out, let's say, when you're with Ellen Langer, you need the inhaler. When you're with Brian Cohen, you don't need the inhaler. The cure is pretty simple, right? Don't be with me or make interactions with me the same way they are with Brian. 
Do you understand? We have a great deal of control over our disease by noticing the ways they're changing. We have a great deal of control over our worlds in general, where we can see opportunities and avoid dangers before they arrive by noticing changes. Things are changing. We can hold them still in our minds in order to feel like we have control, but in so doing, we give up control. Control over our health, our well-being, and all different aspects of our environment. So basically, things are all the while changing. Rather than this illusion of stability, what I'm strongly urging is that we exploit the power in uncertainty. The magic lies in being aware of the ways we mindlessly react to social and cultural cues. We need to challenge the idea that the limits we assume are real have to exist at all. With only subtle shifts in our thinking, our expectations, we can begin to change the ingrained behaviors that zap health, competence, optimism, and vitality from our lives. Let me end by saying that the way for us to recover the challenging spirit in a low growth society is easier than you might imagine. I think what we need to do is be mindful. Thank you. Thank you. 네, 또 굉장히 흥미로운 주제로 강연을 해주셨는데요. 대단히 감사합니다. 자, 그럼 이것으로 기조 연설을 모두 마무리하도록 하겠습니다. 지금부터는 약 30분 정도 휴식 시간을 가진 후에 11시부터 첫 번째 기조 세션을 진행하도록 하겠습니다. 이어지는 기조 세션에도 많은 참석을 부탁드리겠습니다. 휴식 후에 오늘 세션은 본 행사장인 그랜드 볼룸 1과 2에서는 기조 세션이 그리고 바로 옆 그랜드 볼룸 3에서는 특별 세션이 진행이 되겠습니다. 각 세션을 확인하시고 해당 장소에 맞게 참석을 해주시기 바랍니다. 그럼 잠시 후 11시에 뵙겠습니다. 고맙습니다.